Thank you, Roland. It's really my pleasure to facilitate this panel with such an exciting variety of perspectives on the topic. Welcome to all the panelists and thank you for joining. And as we are in a situation where we always have to reinvent travel, I am sure it is very exciting to hear from you a lot of your insights. So Yata on the website talks about reconnecting the world. So I would like to start with Nick and asking what is Yata's plan for reconnecting the world and ramping up global air travel? Nick, would you share some insights? Yeah, thanks, Monica. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, obviously at the moment, uh, there's a, taking advantage of the, uh, the lack of flying to start uh, getting ready for what, the other side of this uh, particular pandemic. And, you know, we've really categorized our, our efforts in, in three main areas. One is to safely uh, reopen uh, borders. And that's really about, um, you know, uh, the travel pass, uh, health certification processes, biosafety measures, which have been by and large implemented and accepted uh, globally, uh, whether we're talking about uh, mm -hmm. clean cleanliness of aircraft and so on. And then it's really about safely restarting the aviation system because it's easy to shut things down, uh, but it's not so easy to restart. And so when you, took, when you look at all these aircraft that are currently being parked, it's not like putting your car in your, uh, in your garage and taking it back out again. There's a lot of effort and coordination required in order to do so. There's also heavy licensing requirements in terms of pilot licensing, crew licensing, maintenance, et cetera, that needs to be managed. And then there's the staffing requirements themselves, and then there's capacity requirements uh, to understand. And we're in a bit of a vicious cycle right now in terms of you know, lack of government clarity in terms of when, when governments will begin to reopen borders. So you know, as flights are in, in the schedule, in the, in the system for booking, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be something that we're going to be able to operate. So lack of clarity around there means we're constantly changing our, our plans in terms of what we uh, what we want to fly and what we will fly and be allowed to fly in the end. And then the last guess, the last part would be, you know, on the other side of this, restoring consumer confidence uh, and looking for opportunities to stimulate demand uh, so that when we come out of this, uh, the pandemic and we're allowed to fly again, that would say the restart is as robust as possible. Thank you. And I think that's a super interesting uh, perspective, the operational challenges that we will face um, once we really can get back to scale. Yeah. Virginia, the World Tourism um, WTTC is much more focused on the economic and social contribution of travel and tourism. Could you tell us something about the plans of WTTC to support the recovery of the travel industry and what role safe travel plays in it? Absolutely, Monica, and a pleasure to be here with this um, in such a distinguished panel. Um, as you said, um, the core of what WTTC does is, is look at the economic and social impact of our sector across um, the globe. However, over the last year, we've certainly been focused in terms of safe travels and how to reopen our, our sector safely. So part of our initiative, yes, it was to look at the impact of COVID and according to our latest estimates, about 174 million jobs were impacted last year. So that means that some of these jobs unfortunately were lost and some of them will be in some supporting schemes from governments, but depending on what happens, I mean, 2021, they could potentially be lost. So there is hope and they're depending on when the, the sector starts to, to reopen and some of these set, um, jobs hopefully will be recovered. And um, we've also been focused on on, on rebuilding consumer confidence, just as Nick was saying. And part of this um, has been through an initiative called the Safe Travels um, Stamp. And we, we have worked with 261 destinations um, to provide consistency in terms of all these health and hygiene protocols across all the different industries, just to provide um, con um, consumer confidence, but also to protect the, the, the staff and, and the workers. Uh, and then lastly, um, I think all of our advocacy work has been focused with governments in terms of enabling that collaboration to reopen the sector safely, to remove all the travel um, barriers and restrictions that um, we have faced over the last few months, such as quarantines and, and, and all the different um, measures that we have seen around the world that have unfortunately halted mobility and had a huge economic and social um, impact. So in terms of our um, ask, um, really it has been all about having a framework in place to reopen um, travel safely and um, through comprehensive testing and, and technology, um, just as Nick was saying. 
Thank you, Virginia. And, and even putting the focus also on governments and on destination and making sense of all of this. Of course, countries which are very strong in tourism have a great interest in opening borders and to support the industry. And I'm very honored that Harris is with us, the tourism minister of Greece. And he has, of course, a question, what is the Greek government doing to enable safe travel into and within the country? Yes, um, uh, thanks for this opportunity to, to express the real need for the tourism ministry to restart. This is not just an economic issue, of course. Um, this is something that we all need, given the fact that we've lived under restrictions and it's been, it's been painfully clear uh, that uh, some return to normality is, is required. So uh, our country today, we chose uh, Itabe to uh, announce the way that we envisage uh, the reopening of uh, tourism, at least as far as our country is concerned. And there's a, a clear lack of a single word. Uh, and I was uh, uh, very glad that the WTDC, my, my friend, mentioned this. We did not talk about quarantines. So we talked about um, vaccination certificates. We talked about antigen tests. We talked about antibody tests. We talked about random testing as you arrive. Uh, we talked about um, many things, for example, prioritizing vaccination for the employees of the tourism industry in order to, to create this both a, a feeling of security, uh, which works both ways, by the way, uh, a feeling of security for the population. They should not be afraid of uh, foreign tourists arriving in the country. And at the same time, uh, we should project this feeling of security and this peace of mind to everyone um, honoring our country in choosing to, to come come to Greece to pass the, the, the time of vacation. So, so this is very, very important for us to ensure that we, um, we provide clarity in terms of the protocols. Now, we've proven that this can happen. It happened last year. We had fewer tools at our disposal. Our um, quiver now is full of arrows. We have the vaccination programs. We have um, rapid tests. We can, we can do many things. And we've innovated with uh, an artificial intelligence system targeting our tests and our borders. So we'll work on that and upgrade our protocols to ensure that uh, safe travel can restart as quickly as possible. Thank you, Harris, for sharing the holistic approach you take in Greece across the sector with the help of the government, using technology and really creating a country level safe travel ecosystem. Thanks for sharing. And um, on the other side, let's move from countries to cruise ships. And a cruise ship in itself is a kind of um, travel bubble, let's call it like that. And a challenge in itself, I guess. So Harry, we are very, very pleased to have you with us. And I was wondering what NZL is working on so that cruises can take off again and traveler feels safe on board. Thank you, Monica. And I, I, I too thank you for, for having me on this distinguished panel along with the other panelists today. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, you know, we, we always looked to uh, create an environment in cruising that's safe for our guests. This, this isn't a, a new concept for us. We've taken safety and security and, 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 and measurements against illness for the entire history of the cruise industry. Uh, obviously, COVID was a little bit different. Uh, and, and we needed to sort of double down on our efforts. So well back uh, in the spring already, we, we stood up uh, what we called our healthy sail panel where we got experts across many different fields from, from medicine, science, tourism, infectious diseases. We've had uh, former you know, government officials on board uh, uh, from many of, of the US governing bodies like the FDA and CDC to sort of help guide us you know, through what safe cruising can, can be. And, and they took this, this, this task very, very seriously, met over a series of many months and developed 74 protocols, uh, which we're committed to. Uh, and we believe that in implementing these 74 protocols, uh, we will provide a safe uh, environment for our guests when they come on board. Um, you know, for, for us, it didn't end there. You know, so we have recommendations. Now it's incumbent on us to work with government officials around the world. You know, I was pleased that I, we met with the Greek tourism minister who's on the panel with us today just last week to talk about this and to see uh, what we can do to restart cruising in, in Greece, hopefully very, very soon. But obviously it doesn't end there. We're meeting with, with people throughout the EU and Italy and Spain, obviously with authorities in, in the US. To, to, to make sure that we understand what they're looking for and that we can continuously adopt our principles 
to make sure that they provide the best and most safe experience for our guests. Thank you, and thank you for sharing. And we see it is really a massive effort of uh, travel providers of countries, uh, of different uh, players in the industry to create this ecosystem. And we heard a lot about recovery plans and, um, and best practices. But now let's shift to the travel behavior. And it's really a, a big question mark. Are all these measures, will they be accepted by the travelers? Will travel be fun? We know that consumer behavior and travel expectations have changed over the time of the pandemic. And I'm really happy to have uh, Jose Felipe with us, who has uh, great insight on uh, consumer behavior from Bloom. And uh, please share with us, what do the empirical studies on consumer behavior say? Why do people refuse to travel even if they could? Yes, thank you so much. So basically, Bloom Consulting is a nation brand and place brand consultancy. And with our sister company, D2 Analytics, that measures uh, the appeal of destinations and, and consumer behavior, we're able to understand um, that even uh, we, we have two scenarios for the future of tourism, basically, at least for the next next five years. We have a more pessimistic scenario and a more optimistic scenario. Still, the optimistic scenario is still not so as optimistic as, as, as would one, one would want. But uh, basically, on the pessimistic scenario, we say that there's going to be a market loss of 35% uh, in terms of uh, uh, tourism. So there's 35% of tourists that were tourists before that say, I don't want to travel again, at least uh, long haul or outside uh, very far away from, uh, from where I live. The more optimistic scenario says it's only a 15% that say that uh, we'll never travel again. Um, so these are numbers that are a little bit gloomy, but, but are numbers to take in consideration. And everything that the countries, regions, and OTAs and so on can do to mitigate that, uh, and it's going to be a more scarce res resource than it was before. Now, the main reason, and what the reason why I'm saying this, is the main reason why people don't want to travel is because they're afraid. Uh, they're afraid of uh, of what might happen if there's a new, uh, um, uh, not even just the, the, this specific pandemic, but if there's a new disease. So this has changed a lot the behavior of people um, socially. And of course, this is also reflected in tourism. So the main reason why they don't do it is like 64% of people that say that they won't travel again. They say it's because uh, they are afraid. So fear is the main reason. Exactly. So we heard a lot, luckily, from all the different participants that building trust and investing into trust building is a key element uh, of all the efforts of the associations and the companies, and that is certainly targeting the right, the right underlying reason. So thanks you, uh, thank you, Jose Felipe, for sharing. And uh, on the other side, it seems that the acceptance of technology is accelerating, at least that is what we see in the Amadeo survey waves we did over the last uh, year. And um, Yata is an example um, of somebody who invested very early on last year and with a high-speed project, I would say, in investing into technology. You created a health, um, um, health aggregator application, the Yata Travel Pass. You adopted um, Yata Thematic, where the country regulations are stored. So Yata is really massively investing into technology to support travel. So, Nick, what do you think is the most important aspect of the digital health passports when it comes to user acceptance and adoption? I, I, mean, I think it's, it's been clear and uh, we've seen statistics from uh, a number of our surveys that would indicate that consumers are ready for it. I think it's a 89% in the most recent survey that we just did, which we released today, uh, are expecting standards. So, I think that's number one. I think, you know, we, we need some standards here and there aren't any when it comes to digital certificates. Um, testing or vaccination, so that 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 is that is a uh, that is a first and foremost requirement for us to be able to be successful as we move forward. Um, an agreed upon process, and, and I'm very encouraged by what Harry said in terms of uh, the Greek government coming forward with a with a plan, because uh, we don't have very many. And to Harry's point, uh, we're all advocating, in Virginia as well, we're all advocating to the same people. We're all asking for very similar things. But because we're not seeing these plans uh, uh, develop, we're, we're, we're kind of at a, a little bit of a standstill. And, and what our fear is that we're going to lose some uh, great opportunity right now while we're, while we're parked, for lack of a better term, to be ready on the other side of it. So, you know, an agreed process moving forward is, is, is significant. We need that from the international bodies to help 
uh, with the uh, with the individual governments that are prepared to move forward on that interoperability. We can all develop, and we're not the only ones that are developing something. But what we are developing is with the intention of interoperability, and that's not the case in other places. Whether that's being driven by commercial interests, whether that's being driven by putting out a, a dealing with a specific problem right now, but not looking into the intermediate and long term uh, of all of all of this. It needs to be secure. So our most recent uh, uh, survey from our customers said they, they're not interested in any type of piece of technology that A, does not put this information in their hands, meaning in their, in their ability to control or on their phones or on their mobile device. And secondly, without a database. So we, and, you know, fortunately for us, we built this with that in mind uh, uh, at, the, at the very onset. So security by design and decentralized technology and utilizing the, the latest and greatest in terms of digital travel credentials, et cetera, was, was essential in terms of the development of that. Uh, harmonization is another key factor that's not currently in place in terms of from one country to another. And without it, we're going to create a, a, a serious hodgepodge of measures that just won't, won't work and won't lead us to that mutual recognition that we all need. And the digitization piece, we can't stress enough because simply for the simple fact that right now you can travel uh, and to, uh, uh, Jose's point, you, you can travel, but there's fear behind it. There's also fear of the unknown. There's also the, the, the fact that quarantines are on the other side of it, by and large, and all those other things that play, play into it. But if we don't digitize, you know, if you can travel today, you travel with a piece of paper. When you fast forward to three months from now, when we believe that we'll begin to see, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, the return of summer travel to a, to a large degree compared to what we've seen in the last 12 months, it will be a complete and utter nightmare in our airports, dead stop. And so digitization and working now with a plan to move forward has, has to happen. And we're actually losing time because we have not seen these things uh, develop at the speed at which we would require them to be. Yeah, and we actually need warp speed to digitize the sector across the different touch points, absolutely, to gain travel back at scale. A lot of challenges to overcome. And uh, again, it's digitization, it's harmonization, and it's collaboration and interoperability, as you said. So moving to the political framework, and you touched this, um, Harris, if the travel regulations on the individual countries reach their limits, what should the uh, European Commission do and regulate now to get travel industry going again? Do you have a wish? Well, yeah. first of all, I, I want to see the digital green pass um, impl being implemented. Um, I think this is um, um, tourism is, is an extrovert industry. It's it's about reaching out. It's about you know uh, touching and understanding each other. Um, so this is exactly what we need to do right now. That's why the Greek government is pushing for this kind of EU coordination. EU should show leadership here, because it's in a unique position. Um, you cannot see this in Asia or Latin America or other regions. Uh, uh, you can only find the kind of institutions that can force this collaboration in Europe. And of course, uh, the international institutions like UNWTO, like WTTC. Uh, Nick mentioned this uh, uh, very well. IATA is in a unique position. It can weave uh, those regulations inside the customer experience, inside the, the way people, you know, travel through the airports. And this is a very, very important thing in order to foster uh, simplicity and in order to foster trust. But it's not enough. Uh, we need to, first of all, uh, show that we care as governments. We care for our citizens. How can a tourist trust the Greek government if it sees that it doesn't care for the health of its own citizens? So it's important that we show that uh, we, we're managing this actively and we're managing this for the health benefit of our tourist guests and of course our citizens uh, alike. So we also need the uh, collaboration with international bodies like WTTC. Virginia mentioned uh, how uh, such a body, UNWTO as well, is trying to create this trust. Uh, in the kind of offerings that the different governments are offering currently to the tourist um, uh, customers. And of course, we need to talk to um, the cruise industry, an industry that was hit very hard. Uh, Harry mentioned it in the beginning of the crisis, which uh, we know the, the specific cases were 
the the uh, reaction was not the best uh, best one. But last year, Greece showed that the cruise industry started without a single incident. That means that those protocols work. The same thing happened in the airplanes. We did not have proliferation. And the, the, what we saw is that the touristic areas were not actually where the second wave came to Greece. The second wave came uh, like it came in the different countries that did not have uh, tourism. And finally, of course, we need to monitor, like Jose said, the needs of the customers, uh, their wants, their long-term uh, changes in the kind of uh, tourism products that uh, have been accelerated uh, in order to be able to provide the service that our future customers want, not just what they wanted yesterday, but what they will want uh, tomorrow and the day after. This is it's not an easy task, but it's a task right. that uh, I think it's an interesting one. Absolutely. And, and as you said, we have already now ex some experience what works and what can be built on. So that's, uh, that's good news as well. About the political frameworks, the most intentional concern of uh, WTTC Virginia is really the cooperation with the governments. What would you say? Do you have the real influence on governments and political organization when it comes to the implementation of the global health and safety standards for travel? Sure. So I think it's encouraging to see what the minister was just saying in the EU. There, there seems to be that political will to accelerate things and to have this pass in place and hopefully um, see a recovery through the summer. Unfortunately, what we have seen over the last year or so is, is the lack of coordination amongst governments and, and therefore changing restrictions that have just completely undermined consumer confidence on top of, of, of what was already um, there. So I think that collaboration is, is inevitable and, and not only between governments, also with the private sector, hence what, what we have been trying to bring all these stakeholders um, together. So, so we hope to see more of this in the future as, as we begin to recover. Um, we are plugged into other processes like the OECD, for example, who have a very ambitious initiative to, to try to come up with a framework in terms of international testing and vaccinations and including also some of the interoperability aspects amongst the, the OECD countries, which are obviously like-minded and hopefully will be able to come up with, with, a, with a good solution. But I think in terms of our perspective, we obviously need to learn to live with this virus. This is not going away. We all know that. That's why all these protocols are relevant. And that's why this collaboration is critical for us to be able to, to recover and to bring back millions of jobs and, and also restart economies that are so dependent on, on our sector. Absolutely. Thank you, Virginia. And um, Harry, if you swapped your CEO hat for policymakers hat for a day, what measure would you put in place to rescue the travel and tourism industry? You know, it's, it's a really great question. And I want to start out that I, I have great <laughs> respect. I have great respect for the government policymakers. And, and I'm not sure it's possible in this environment to make every decision a good decision, because obviously we're dealing with something that, that is unprecedented. Uh, uh, and I know it's a cliche, but in this case, this really has been unprecedented. You know, I, 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 would, I would say the key ask from our side, and, and perhaps how I might approach this different, is to perhaps approach this more from a partnership perspective. I, I think until quite recently, um, and, and you know, the meetings with the Greek minister are a nice exception to this role, but until quite recently, the governments have sort of operated independently uh, of each other and independently of the mm -hmm. tourism industry. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important to realize, you know, we're not the enemy here. You know, we all have a, a common goal. We want to pro provide safe, healthy, environmentally friendly vacations to, pa to passengers, to, to guests, so that they can see the world in, in, in a safe environment. Uh, and I think that's the same goal the governments have. And I think perhaps a more collaborative approach uh, would get us uh, a little quicker to our end goal. You know, I, I think some of the comments that the other panelists made on restoring confidence uh, and, and reducing fear are really, really important. And I think a collaborative approach uh, with perhaps slightly more uniform standards would really help build, build that. So collaboration is a key element actually to solve the issue faster. I absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you, Nick. And Jose Philip, uh, to, to wrap up, do we have any insights on the predictions on the forecasts of uh, people's travel behavior, especially with regards to safe travel? You can look in the future in Plum Consulting, I suppose. Yes. So beyond the pessimistic or optimistic scenario, there is one that is a realistic scenario, which is 
uh, we saw that uh, from the data that we have, like there's going to be a, a change in behavior on the tourism behavior. Like 50% of tourists will choose a different destination or a different product within the, des the same destination, right? So it's uh, uh, because of, of the pandemic. And, and this split, so this this 46% approximately, um, inside this 46%, so the ones that said I would choose a different product or a different offer, you split in two as well. So they, they would look for products or destinations that um, have healthcare as a, a guarantee of a good healthcare system, which is something that was not in the radar in the past, uh, less, uh, of course, for extreme situations. Now it is, okay, well, what happens if something happens to me there, right? So that's one. And the other part is definitely um, looking for different types of products, more related to nature, more related to less crowded destinations and so on. So that's the two main blocks. Okay. So it's really destination planning with regard to safe travel and uh, the new products. Thank and you so much. And I, completely, and I agree completely with Harry when he was talking about the collaboration. This is the key to, to mitigate all this. Absolutely. I have a wonderful last question to all of you, but no time left. So what I will do is I will mail all that it to you and ask for your contribution and we will publish it on the Amadeus blog. The last question would have been, what do you think is our biggest hurdle in creating a safe travel ecosystem? We don't have the time to listen to your answers, but please expect an email and we publish them. Thanks a lot. Great panel, great insights from all perspectives. Have a good time. Bye-bye.